Hi, good morning everyone. Let's start just by checking how many people here have taken a DNA test. Look at that, everybody. Thanks. Thank you anyway to FDDNA for sponsoring this area. And of course it gives me great pleasure to introduce my colleague Debbie Kennett. We actually live within about 10, 10 miles of each other down in the southern part of England. And I'm getting to the stage where I say Debbie almost needs no introduction. All of you sit there and read blogs and whatever that she does. You know, she's a phenomenon in terms of what she does in the DNA area. So I'm sure you're in for a, a treat this morning. Autosomal DNA demystified. Maybe you can it. Okay, well thank you. Thank you very much, Brian, for that uh, introduction. Um, so my talk this morning, I'm going, uh, we've got a mixture of people in the audience, some people who've taken a DNA test and some who haven't. So what I'm going to do is just run through the, the basics of how autosomal DNA works. And I've also got a little case study at the end showing you how to actually use autosomal DNA in practice. Um, so just um, as a, a reminder, first of all, there are three different types of tests that we use um, for genetic genealogy. The Y chromosome test is the one that follows that direct male line and that normally coincides with the transmission of surnames. The mitochondrial DNA test follows the all-female line, but that test can be taken by both males and females. But the one that we'll be looking at this morning is autosomal DNA, which will give you matches with genetic cousins on all of your family lines. Now, why DNA and mitochondrial DNA can be used for close genealogy and more distant genealogy, but autosomal DNA is best used for recent generations, within about the last five or six generations. And that's partly a limitation of the DNA, but also a limitation of our family trees. Uh, okay, so the test itself, it does, this is the big thing about autosomal DNA, both men and women can take this test. So previously, the first test that was available was Y chromosome DNA, so all us women had to go around and try and persuade our men to test. But now women can participate just as much as the men. And it works on the principle that the more DNA that you share and the more segments of DNA that you share, the closer the relationship. But the difficulty is when you get a match, it could be on any one of your um, ancestral lines. So then it's back to the paperwork to try and work out the connection. And with this test, it's best to test as many of your family members as possible and to test the oldest members of your family. So if you can test your parents or an aunt or an uncle, it takes you back that one further generation and, and also takes the test back that little bit further for you. But also you need to test as many close relatives as possible. And when we first started having these tests available, I paid something like 180 pounds to have my parents tested. Now you can buy an autosomal DNA test, it's 40 pounds on the family tree DNA stand there. So it's, it's a practical proposition to test lots of close family members. There are two main ways that we use the test. First of all, if you've got a particular hypothesis to test, um, perhaps you've got a grandfather and he had two wives and are you sure that the children from both of the marriages, are they all his? So you now have a way of testing hypotheses like that. You test two first cousins and you see if they share enough DNA for the expected relationship. So you could actually distinguish between, say, a first cousin and a half cousin with this test, or a full sibling or a half sibling. And the other thing is also just to actually verify your family history research. How many people have been able to fill out all the boxes on their family tree going back for all those generations? Anyone? Okay, how many people have managed to fill out just going back one, two, three, but four generations. So that's quite a few. How do you know that the connections that you've made are correct? Um, because we have something called um, an NPE. Um, Emily Alicino has coined the term not the parent expected. And these occur at a rate of about 1%, 2% per generation. And that has a cumulative effect. So even if you've done perfect genealogical research, how do you know that your research is correct unless you've got it verified through DNA testing? The other way we use these tests is what we call doing a fishing trip, where you just take a test out of curiosity just to see what it throws up. And if I was doing this talk five years ago, I would have said that was a long shot. 
but today the databases are growing at a phenomenal rate and people are getting matches that will help them with their research at the outset. And also that is helping especially with unknown parentage cases and um, like founding cases because all it takes is a match with something like a, um, you know, say a first or second cousin. If you match a first cousin, you share the same grandfather. If you match a second cousin, you know you share the same great grandfather. So then it's just a question of following the lines forward until you can identify a suitable candidate. But before you take any of these tests or before you persuade your relatives to test, you need to be prepared for the unexpected. And we had one story just last week of a woman in Ireland who'd taken a DNA test and she found a brother that she didn't know she had. Now the brother himself had been brought up, he was born in a mother and baby home in Ireland. He didn't think he had any siblings at all. And from this match, he actually discovered that he had this new sibling that he didn't know about, but he actually had another eight siblings. So from one DNA test, he's gone from being an only child to suddenly having nine siblings. But there are also some, uh, sometimes some surprises which we don't expect. This was a story in America of two people who, after taking a DNA test, discovered that they had been swapped in the hospital um, by mistake. One person ended up with 50% Jewish when she was expecting English, Welsh and Scottish, and the other person didn't get the Jewish and was ending up with the English, Welsh and Scottish. So when they actually went back and looked at their records, they were both born on the same day, both born in the same hospital. So that was the only logical conclusion. But that is rare, but if it happens to you, it's, you know, that's a one in a million, one in five million chance. But just to, just to be aware that these things can happen. And we've ha I've had a number of people um, that I know where they've taken a DNA test and they've discovered their father is not their father. Um, there have been a lot of secrets covered up, but now there are no secrets with DNA. As the databases get bigger, all these secrets are going to come out. Um, now we have, a, at the moment, with autosomal DNA, we have a choice of five different companies. This recording is going to go up on the YouTube channel, so you can pause the uh, recording and, and look at the uh, different uh, things I put on the chart there. Um, so there's all sorts of different things you may want to consider with choice of company. Price is one of them. That, that's the price, including shipping, if you're buying um, online. But at the, at the moment, all of the, um, the tests are on special offer at the show. 23andMe are the only company who aren't here. Their test, I would say, is not worth doing for genealogy because it's just too expensive for genealogy, but it, it's quite interesting from the health side. Um, we've got two new companies. My Heritage, a very, very new uh, People aren't getting many matches in the database at the moment, so it remains to be seen how they're going to work out. Living DNA are not doing the genealogy matching at the moment, they're only doing the ethnicity estimates. So they're a sort of, un well, they're an unknown quantity. Uh, but it's also the things like the database size. Now, Ancestry have a massive database, but they sell in a limited number of countries at the moment. So if you want to test someone in Japan or China or Brazil, you wouldn't be able to test them through Ancestry. Um, and Family Tree DNA, they, they've actually been selling um, here for much longer than Ancestry, but they have a smaller database. But the, the lim one of the big limitations of Ancestry is that you have to have a subscription to access all the features, which I'll go into later. And I should just say that if you've got Who Do You Think You Are magazine, I've got a big article in there all about the different testing companies. It's on special, I think it's £4 at the show here, so I cover all the different tests in there. So those are, just, those are just some of the things that you may want to consider and also the availability of Y-DNA and mitochondrial DNA because that is also very helpful to use in combination with autosomal DNA. Um, now if you test at, if you've tested at Ancestry, how many people have tested at Ancestry here? It's quite a few. How many people have tested at Family Tree DNA? Not so many. Okay, so if you've tested at Ancestry, what you can do is you can transfer your results for free to the Family Tree DNA database. How many people have done the transfer? Okay, so you can all go home and do that when you, when you get back. So that, the transfer itself is free, so you get all the matches. 
but you can then unlock the, 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 there's an extra layer where you can get the access to the chromosome browser which is something that answers you don't have and also to get the um, the my origins uh, results and you can also do a free transfer to my heritage um, you have to set up a my heritage account first of all at the moment they're doing the free transfers um, we're not getting very many matches with my heritage and the quality of the matches is not very good at the moment but especially if you want to if you're if you've got an unknown parentage case or you're trying to solve a mystery where you're relying on other people matching you really need to be in as many databases as possible because you just don't know where the breakthrough match is going to come from and i would say any serious genealogist you need to be at least in the ancestry database and the family tree dna database <coughs> Okay, so just a little bit of biology. I don't want to go into too much, but just so that um, we can understand the basics. Um, we in, within the cells in our body, we ha um, it, the cell is divided into two parts. In the, the outer bit is called the cytoplasm, and that's where the mitochondria are floating around. But the bit in the middle is the uh, nucleus, and it's in this nucleus that we have these structures called chromosomes and that those chromosomes are the structures that contain our DNA and that we get our chromosomes in pairs. So we get 23 chromosomes from our mother, 23 chromosomes from our father. And two of those chromosomes are the sex chromosomes. So if you're a female, you will get an X chromosome from your mother, you'll get an X chromosome from your father. If you're a male, you'll have an X chromosome from your mother and you'll have a Y chromosome from your father. <laughs> The Y chromosome is passed on unchanged, but the, or, the feature about the autosomes is before they get passed on to you, they go through this process of recombination. So that the DNA that you get from your parents is a patchwork of the DNA of your, all four of your grandparents, all eight of your great, great, of your great grandparents. And the thing that the other point about autosomal DNA is that it's diluted with each generation. So you will inherit 50% of your DNA from your mother, 50% from your father, but that means that 50% from each parent is lost um, right from the outset. So with your grandparents, you will share roughly 25% of your DNA with all four of your grandparents. But because the recombination is a random process, you may share 20% with one grandfather and you may share 30% um, with your with a grandmother um, and that's something that you won't know until you've tested so you're going to get different representations of your ancestors in your DNA and two siblings can test and they will also get different representations of their ancestors so you may have one sibling who gets more of a, your maternal grandfather and another one gets less of him um, just pu purely because of this random process and then once you get much further out, you can see how the DNA is very much diluted. Um, so you, you may actually have DNA from your great, 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 great grandfather, but to actually show up as a match with a fifth cousin, you've both got to share the same bits of DNA to show up as a match in the database. So this is what a chromosome browser looks like. This is actually a comparison of my son with his grandmother. And you can see the orange bits of DNA are the segments of DNA that they share in common. And you can see it's quite a random process. So if you look on chromosome 22 here, they don't actually have any, they don't share any DNA at all. And if you look at chromosome 18, they've inherited the entire, they've both got the, the same segment in common. So this is a very, very random process. But you can see how the DNA is passed on in big chunks. And if we go out to third cousins, you can see we've only got these just a few little bits of DNA that we share in common. And then if you were to go out to like fourth and fifth cousins, if you're going to share any DNA at all, it's likely just to be one segment. And when you only share one segment, it then becomes very difficult to actually work out the relationship from DNA alone. So this is a feature of this chromosome browser that you get with the family tree DNA test that you don't get with um, ancestry. And I really like just being able to test family members and just see the inheritance process. I actually find it quite educational just to understand how DNA is passed on through the generations. So if you wanted to take a test, um, for, you've got a hypothesis to test, you need to bear in mind the chances of 
um, your success. So um, if you've got two second cousins, um, they should match with almost certainty. We've not yet had a case of two second cousins where it's been proven that they don't match. Um, so if you have two second cousins, they don't match, you both need to go back and start asking some awkward questions of your family members. But once you get out to third cousins, there will be some third cousins who uh, they will have a genuine genealogical relationship, but they don't actually share enough DNA on the same segments to actually show up as a match. But if you test lots of third cousins who all share the same answers, you should still find some of them match. Um, so that again, it's useful to test more people from each family so that you can actually form conclusive relationships. And then once you get out to fifth, sixth cousins, the chances of actually matching a specific fifth cousin or a sixth cousin is actually very remote. But the other side of the coin is that we have thousands and thousands of fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth and uh, ninth distant cousins. So when you take a test, as you probably found those of you who've tested, you end up with loads and hundreds and hundreds of uh, these distant cousins in the database. But they're very, it's very difficult to find those connections um, at that level with this type of test. Um, I'm only going to focus on ancestry DNA and family tree DNA just to show you the differences between the two. So those of you who've tested with ancestry DNA, this is what you've seen for your home page. You get the ethnicity reports and you get the um, matches. So uh, the people who've tested with ancestry, how many fourth cousin matches have you got? Has anyone got more than I have at 47? All right, anyone got more than a hundred? Right, anyone more than a thousand? No. <laughs> if you're Jewish, you end up with thousands, but um, that's the exception. Um, and they also have these shared ancestor hints. How many people have got shared ancestor hints? Quite a few. I've only got two. Some people, how many people have got more than 10? Oh, gosh, you're doing really well. <laughs> Okay, so if you haven't tested an answer tree, that's what the match list looks like. And you get the, um, they give you the um, predicted relationship and you can then go through and view the match and view their family tree. Um, and also if you get one of these shaky leaf hints and they really do shake on the page and stand out, um, they will actually predict the relationship for you. And in this case, they got it spot on um, and they will actually show you how you're related. Um, and they've also just introduced this new genetic communities feature, which is actually really more of a useful way of filtering the matches. Um, so I'm in this Southern English community and it gives me a list of the matches who are in that community. So I've got 42 matches. But one of the problems is you get a, lot, a vast number of matches of people in America with all this distant colonial ancestry and you really don't want to sort through thousands of matches. So this is a way of filtering those matches and focusing on the most recent ones. Um, now, with Ancestry, you do have to have a subscription to access a lot of these features. So the shared ancestor hints, which is very useful, you only get that if you are uh, a subscriber. And they have other things like DNA circles and new ancestor discoveries, which you have to, you, you need to be a subscriber to access those. And also, you, you can get the outline of the family tree with the names, but if you want to click through and see the full family tree, again, you need to be a subscriber to get those benefits. This is what the family tree DNA homepage looks like, which some of you will be familiar with. So it's a similar sort of thing, but the, the thing that I like about family tree DNA is that you can combine all three tests together on one account. So I've got mitochondrial DNA on there, my father's got the Y DNA, mitochondrial DNA and family finder together. And this is what my matches look like at family tree DNA. And they have this system here where if you list your surnames, if the surname is shared in common, it will be highlighted in bold. Uh, it's done with a sound deck system, which isn't that brilliant, but it's still a good way of actually highlighting those surnames. And you can see here, I've tested both my parents. Luckily, I didn't have an MPE in my family tree. And I've tested my son and they show up as expected parent-child relationships. And then they again give you the predicted relationship ranges. And this is a chromosome browser view. This is actually my son and his two maternal grandparents. And this is a, just a nice thing that you can do when you've tested lots of close family members because you can actually see this uh, 
process of recombination in action. So my son gets his, um, he gets one entire chromosome, from uh, all his maternal chromosomes from me, and you can actually see how those, that chromosome fits together. You can see half is from his maternal grandfather, the other half from his maternal grandfather. And then when you do this process, you can then also, if you get a match as we have here, you can act, this match, you can see that that particular part of the, um, that segment that is shared with the match is actually on the paternal grandfather's chromosome. So you can actually start to sort of map out which bits of segments you share with which particular um, ancestors. Um, so that the, the more people that you can test in your family, the easier that process um, then becomes. And the other nice thing that you have at Family Tree DNA is we have projects. And I run the Devon projects, and there's all sorts of other county projects and uh, special projects for adoptees, donor conceived. Um, if you were going to test lots of post family members, what you can do is you can actually apply to set up your own little family project, and you can have all the family members testing in that project. And that's a nice way of being able to um, you know, compare all the results together. And the other thing you can do is they have this tool, um, the advanced matching tool, where you can actually look to see which matches you have within a project. So I can compare results here in my Devon project and my Cruise project. And you can also um, compare results. So if you've got people who've taken a Y DNA test, you can see if they share the Y DNA and the Family Finder matches. So that's one way of, again, filtering the matches. If someone shares a match with you on the Y DNA line and an autosomal DNA, DNA match, you know that um, unless you've got any other connections, it has to be on that direct paternal line. And this is just a word of warning about small segments. Family Tree DNA does give you matches going right down to 1 cm. A cm is just the, the unit we use to measure the size of a segment. But those segments are generally just noise, false positive matches. And you can see this here with my um, son again. If I set the browser right down to 1 cm, we get all these little bits of DNA that shouldn't be there. And it just defies the biological inheritance process. So just be very wary. And um, I would recommend only using the chromosome browser with segments over 5 cm. So if you drop it down to 1 cm, you can find connections with you know, virtually the entire population of Europe and that most of them are just false positive matches and so just a few tips I just wanted to share so it's very important that you actually upload a family tree to get the most out of your matches so that people can actually see that they've got the tree and that you can compare results and when you've got this long list of matches it's best to focus on the shared surnames shared geographical locations and the more close family members you test, the easier it becomes to assign the matches. So if you test your, say, your first cousin and you and your first cousin share a match, you know the match must be, is like to be on that line. And it's also very helpful to use Y-DNA, mitochondrial DNA, to rule matches in or out on specific uh, lineages. And um, don't be disillusioned if you have thousands and thousands of matches and, it, and you can't find a connection. That is normal for everyone. Um, you will only find matches with a small subset of the people that are in your match list. And that's especially the case for these, all these fifth to distant cousin matches. Um, so don't be disillusioned if you don't find connections. It's not your genealogy it's, uh, that's at fault. It's just that some of these matches are very, very distant. And the other thing that you get with these tests is the biogeographical ancestry analysis or admixture. The companies like to call it ethnicity, um, but the anthropologists don't like us using that word because ethnicity is really what you decide what you want to be. Um, so biogeographical ancestry is the proper scientific term. So um, uh, with these, uh, they are, the results are accurate at the continental level. So if, if it tells you you're European, Asian, African, that's accurate. Unless we go right down to 0.1%, that's not necessarily reliable. And also with Jewish DNA, that's something else that shows up very strongly with this type of test. But once they start to go down to sub-regions like British and Irish, French and German, that's where it becomes much less reliable. Um, so this is me at 23andMe. I am, according to them, I'm 56% British and Irish and 
13 percent French and German within the last 500 years. All my lines are actually from England. I've got one great 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 grandmother from Ireland, one great 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 grandfather from Scotland. These are my results from Ancestry, and now I am 21 percent Great Britain, 20 percent Ireland, and no French and German. Um, each company had they had all have their own reference data sets and those are all different they all use different algorithms so that's one of the reasons why the results differ family tree dna until a few days ago these are my results there broadly in line with ancestry and i was uh, um, 57 percent british isles and they just updated their database in the last couple of days and now suddenly i've gone up to 100 percent british isles uh, but my husband, on the other hand, he's now gone down and he's only 15% British Isles. So um, you can't really take these results too seriously beyond the continental level. But there is the, the other new company, Living DNA, that they, they do provide these regional breakdowns. Um, and that does actually correlate broadly with my ancestry. But they at the moment don't do matching. And even when they do matching, they, they've started very late. So they're not likely to have the same database as the other testing companies. And I just wanted to mention briefly GEDmatch, um, which, um, how many people have used GEDmatch? It's quite a few. So that's, GEDmatch is a very useful way of comparing results if you've tested with, say if you match someone who's tested at 23andMe and you've tested at Family Tree DNA, you can both upload your results to GEDmatch and then you can do the comparisons there. And this is a free site provided by volunteers um, and they've, they've got a whole variety of tools. You can do all these admixture calculators. You can look and see if you're, you know, the, if they can predict your eye colour. And there's all sorts of other fancy things that you can use there. There are also a whole load of other um, third-party tools. I won't go into those for now. But when you go to the ISOG wiki, there's a page in there of autosomal DNA tools that you can use. Now, I wanted to um, today just to to present a case report just to show how we use DNA in practice. And this is actually a story relating to someone who joined my Devon project about a, a year ago. And he had um, an unknown great grandfather. He had, um, how many people have got a birth certificate like this with a nice blank name for the um, father? So quite a few. I think everyone is gonna find one of these in their family trees. Now, um, Tony Wood, who's the uh, my project member, he's actually in the audience today, and I'm going to ask Tony just to come up and just tell us a little bit about the search for his uh, um, great-grandfather. And you can see that he actually started his research with the date on the birth certificate, 1992. So this search has been going on before DNA tests even came onto the scene. Okay, so Tony, would you like... We've lost the... Oh, Brian, we need the microphone. Yeah. Okay, of course you do. Good morning, everybody. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank Debbie. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, firstly, I'd like to give many thanks to Debbie for the time that she spent on my case uh, and for inviting me here today. Um, I Excuse me for uh, working with notes, but Debbie's told me I've only got three minutes and otherwise I'd go on for an hour. I've been researching my family history for around 40 years, um, but I'm continually surprised by new innovations such as increased online accessibility and more recently the advances in genealog genealogical DNA research. Now this slide uh, is for the birth of my grandfather, James Polly Blank Wood in 1870. You'll see that he was born illegitimately in the Kingsbridge Union Workhouse to my great-grandmother, Sarah Wood. And as usual for illegitimate births, no father is shown. Until the time of the issue of this certificate in 1992, I'd always believed my grandfather was plain James Wood. So the middle name of Polly Blank came as a little bit of a surprise. Uh, my father was very ill at this particular time and sadly passed away a few weeks later, so I never got the chance to talk to him about it, but I firmly believe that he never knew the truth about his father. Okay. 
Uh, this slide shows an extract from the 1871 census. Uh, you can see Sarah, uh, then aged 25, along with James, aged eight months, and a daughter, Mary Louise, aged two. In fact, Sarah had two illegitimate children prior to entering the workhouse, uh, which was along with her father, um, sometime prior to 1869. Sadly, both of those children died in infancy. She had a further son, Samuel, born in the workhouse in 1882. Sarah finally left the workhouse soon after and married in 1886. Unfortunately, not to Mr. Polyblank, and she died a widow in 1911. Now, back to James Polyblank Wood. Once James left the workhouse, every census return shows him as plain James Wood, i.e. with no middle name. This was also the case on his marriage certificate in 1893. So, why the middle name of Polyblank? As most of you will know, it was often the case that mothers of illegitimate children would use a middle, and sometimes a first, name as a clue to the identity of the father. I puzzled over this for many years, knowing that Polyblank, or its der derivative, Polyblank, was a surname local to the South Hams area of Devon but which Mr. Polyblank. A breakthrough came in May 2015 when a gentleman called Keir Polyblank wrote an article in the Devon Family Historian. Uh, sorry, I've lost my place. Um, entitled Polyblank. Oh, that's an unusual name. So I then wrote to Keir, who kindly provided me with a complete Polly Blank of the Polly Blank family tree. He suggested I con contacted Gail Polly Blank in Canada, who runs a one name study for the surname. Gail and I have exchanged probably hundreds of emails, and we eventually decided that both I and her brother Gary would take DNA tests. We put the results in various places, including the Devon DNA project, which is run by Debbie. Debbie informed us that we had almost identical matches and had, has been helping us ever since. Again, with dozens of emails being exchanged as things progress. Uh, I'll now hand you back to Debbie to interpret the results. Okay. So the first test that we did was actually a Y chromosome test, and you can see the this um, that um, Gail and Gary, her brother, they both given permission to have their names used. I did actually bl um, blank out Gary's name before I got the permission. But so this is Gary, and this is his most distant ancestor, and you can see pulley blank most distant known ancestor. So with the Y DNA, we had a close match. This was on 35 out of 37 markers. So this Y-DNA test effectively confirmed that the, um, Tony's um, great-grandfather was a polyblank polyblank. But the limitation of the Y-chromosome DNA test, it tells you that two men are related, but it doesn't tell you when they're related. So we've got this wonderful family tree going back to the uh, 1600s, but the, uh, um, Tony's actual ancestor could be anywhere on that tree. So I suggested that they have um, they do the family finder test, so both Gail and Gary did a family finder test. I wasn't really actually expecting anything, um, it was really more in, well, just in hope than anything else. But when the results came in, Gary um, came up as a predicted second to fourth cousin here. And Gail was predicted to be a fifth cousin to a remote cousin. Now, Gail and Gary, they match as full siblings in the database, so we know that whatever their relationship is with Tony, it has to be the same relationship. It's just that they share different amounts of DNA. And I've just put this chromosome browser up for you to show, up, you, to show you 
Um, this is how they match. So this is Gary. You can see how he's got so much more DNA that he shares with Tony than Gail has. But they, um, Gail is on this little bit here and this little bit here. So this is really just another example of why it's so important to test other family members. If Gail had been the one to test and if uh, Gary hadn't tested, we might have thought this was a very distant relationship. And that's just a close-up of showing the uh, chromosome browser there. So we can actually, at Family Tree DNA, you can actually download the segment information and work out how much DNA is shared. And um, you can see that Gary and Tony share, works out about 93 cm. So cm is just a unit we use to measure the amount of shared DNA. And Tony and Gail share about 14.9 cm. This one segment is rather small, um, not necessarily a real segment, but we'll just leave it there for now. Um, so how many people have used this shared CMs project and looked at the statistics in that? One lady at the back there, a couple of people. So this is a very useful way of doing a check on relationships. This is in the ISOC wiki and the autosomal DNA statistics page. I've got the link coming up later. But we can look at this, we know how much DNA is shared, and then we can actually narrow down the possibilities. So we know that um, Tony and uh, Gary share 93 CMs. So when we actually look at the relationships that share that amount of DNA, we're left with just these relationships here. Now, if we add in that um, uh, Gail and Tony only share 15 CMs, um, can you see which relationships might be ruled out by the fact that they share such a small amount of DNA in common? We can see here, second cousins, they should be expected to share at least 43 CMs. So we know, and also second, um, first cousins twice removed, it's, it would be an extreme outlier if that was the relationship. And also with fourth cousins, I have kept that on here because it's 93 but that would have to be an extreme outlier for them to be fourth cousins. Okay, so um, we're then left with just these possible relationships from those test results, okay? Um, so now it's a question of going back to the paper trail and trying to work out the relationship. Um, so we went through this process. Um, the great-grandfather, we ruled him out. He was too young. In the, 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 uh, the moment of conception was around about October 1869, if um, it was a full nine month uh, gestation period. Um, so that's one person ruled out. The great great grandfather was born in 1827, but he died in 1868, and the children were all too young. The oldest would have been about 12, um, so we've managed to rule him out. And then the great great grandfather. He was born in 1802, he was still alive, he was 75, so we can't necessarily rule him out, but he seems unlikely. So we're now left with the, his sons, and, and he did have a number of sons, and these are his children, so we've got nine children, three of them were daughters, so that means we're now left with six possible candidates, six sons. And the relationship, if one of these sons was the father, would actually be that of the third cousin once removed. And you can see the 93 CMs that shared is that fits very, very nicely within that range. And in fact, the, the fact that um, Gail and Tone don't share very much doesn't really matter because even if they didn't share any DNA, that would still fit with that relationship range. Uh, that's the link to the wiki page if you wanted to, uh, um, you can, um, pause the uh, the, the uh, recording online to see that. Um, so now we'd, we want to look at the sons. We have six possible candidates. Son number one we've already ruled out because he was, uh, that's Sir Gail's um, great, great grandfather. He'd already died by 1869. Um, number two, he was still around. He was a widower um, in 1869. His wife had, um, had just died. So he's one possible candidate. And the place where um, James Polly Blankwood was actually in Churchstow. Um, so that's not too far away, eight and a half miles away. So he's still one possible candidate. Um, the second one, George Polly Blank was still alive and he was still around. He was in the army. He actually had three wives in total. 
1871, he was with his wife in Bickley, and he was 22 miles away. Um, the fourth candidate, he, his wife died in 1865, and he was a widower, and he was living in Aveton, Aveton Gifford, I think it's pronounced, and he was about two and a half miles away from Churchstow. And um, number five, we can rule out he sadly died as a baby, age two. And number six, Edwin Pulley Blank, he was only 20 in 1869, and Sarah by that time was 31. So he's still a possibility, um, but we think it's unlikely. So um, although we've now left with four candidates as a result of this DNA test, whereas Back in 1992, we didn't have a clue. So how many people think that number two is the... Uh, okay, how many people think number three? How many people think number four? Quite a lot of you. How many people think number six? Right, okay. Well, we don't actually know the answer at the moment. So <laughs> <laughs> because their DNA, it raises, also, it, it provides answers, and each answer raises a new question. So this is where we want, we need to do further research and we need to trace the living descendants. But Tony and Gail both think it's number four. So that's where we're going to be focusing our efforts. And if we can test a descendant of number four, um, we would, ex if that was the correct relationship, we'd expect a much close, they, they should share the right amount of DNA for whether it be like second cousins or first cousins. Um, but um, uh, did you want to say anything more about the possible candidates? Well, I'm glad you all picked number four, or most of you. <laughs> um, both Gail and I think that that is the most likely situation. Um, two reasons, really. One, I think she quite probably would have used the name James. Um, and also, uh, he was probably the closest uh, to where, where uh, James was uh, at the time, two and a half miles away. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused because I'm not quite sure how uh, my great-grandmother managed to get out of the workhouse every now and again <laughs> and have all these children. Um, but the interesting thing is that uh, before she went in, um, she had an agricultural background, and so did James Pulleyblank. So my theory is that um, they probably were allowed out at harvest time to help, and uh, kind of met behind the haystack. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, as, as Debbie said, we've got some work to do yet, and I've taken some more tests, um, which we hope might show something up. But um, for the moment, thank you for voting for number four. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Tony, for sharing your story with me. I just thought that was a nice practical demonstration of how DNA works in practice, and also it shows how you combine the genealogy research and also the Y DNA results with the autosomal DNA results to actually come to a conclusion. Um, so um, I just wanted to mention at the end um, a range of resources. I saw we have a stand over there. We are an independent organisation can provide independent advice on all the different testing companies. We have a website, we have a wiki. We also have lots of different mailing lists and Facebook groups. There's a now a very vibrant genetic genealogy community. There are always people willing to answer questions if you need any help once you've taken a DNA test. And the, um, so if you go to some of those things, then there's also a whole load of blogs out there. So if you want to keep up to date with all the latest news in the world of genetic genealogy. Okay, so does anyone have any questions? Could, could, we, could we just give Debbie a round of applause before we take the questions? <laughs> And Tony as well. And Tony. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Questions? Is there any information on the chromosome about, uh, browser and how to use it? It just confuses the hell out of me at the moment. Um, right. Well, it's just a question of... Um, let me see if I can go back.
Um, you can do it from this page, and you need to, if you put a tick in there and a tick in there, and you can then click on the chromosome browser, and it, you can put... Sorry. Um, I saw you could compare five different people, yes. put them up, didn't know what that meant. Well, you just select the people that you want to compare on the match list, and then it's it's really just a way of looking at the, the matches and getting a visual representation of the matches. You don't have to do that if you don't need to. The, the actual critical amount is the amount of shared DNA, but if, if, particularly if you want to isolate particular segments to particular ancestors, it's a nice thing to do. So it, it's a bonus, I would say. It's not a necessity. You don't have to, to use it. Um, oops. So this one here, that is what we're seeing here is that is from Tony's account, and he is comparing his DNA to um, uh, Gary, who's in orange, and comparing to Gail, who's in blue. Okay, so it, it it's done from one individual's perspective, and then you just compare the matches that you have with that individual. You can call up other names here for this bit. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Any, anyone else? No? Yes. Sorry, I just wanted to re-ask. Where can I get the slides from? Where, are they, where will you be showing them? Or where is it live? Um, oh, on the... If you search DNA lectures, who do you think you are live, you'll find the, the website there. What I think I will... I meant to do it beforehand. What I will do is I'll make a PDF of the slides available, which you can also... Um, I'll put the link on, on there so that you can download those, um, so that you can refer to the different charts and things. Anyone else? Yes. Um, the biogeographical information, what I can't get a hold of is if one centimorgan is noise, where does the, the realm of, or how many, how many centimorgans are used for biogeographical bio information? So uh, where, where can you distinguish between a, a distant relative who's actually a relative or just a biogeographical? It's, it, they work in a different way. Each company does it in a slightly different way. Um, but it, it's comparing, they look at individual markers or SNPs and do a sort of comparison to those. It's not using segment comparisons with that. Um, 23andMe is a bit different. They do actually do, um, they do like little windows of matches that are all together. Um, but they all have their different systems. They don't actually use the full number of markers that are on the chip when they do those comparisons. But you're effectively being matched to the closest reference populations within the database. So it may, so if you were say from I don't know um, a particular place in India, and that reference population wasn't in the database, you would be matched to the next closest one. Um, so it's all a question of who's in the database. Any other questions? I don't know if that's a good or a bad really? sign. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I don't quite understand the segments. And do they belong to different people, different members, different family members? But this bit here? Yeah. Um, yes, the, the, the two colours represent two different people who are matching Tony. Right. So one is... One is um, Gary and one is Gail. Gary and Gail are siblings. Okay? Okay. <laughs> no, no one else? Well, you have a lot to play with, that's for sure, when you come to work your <laughs> way around through this, that, 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 that's for sure. But clearly this is going to be part of the future as how this is all going to help you break through walls, back brick walls that are in your family trees. Okay? <laughs> If there are no more questions, then again, I'd like you to put your hands together very much for Debbie for a nice clear presentation. <laughs>